I, I don't know what to do. I, I can't seem to help her, and, and nothing I say or do stops her from focusing on it. When she's not crying, she just wants to tell me how bad it is. And she constantly wants to know how I'm feeling, how I'm doing. I, I, I don't want to talk about it yet. I, I, just, I just want to stay busy, keep my mind going on, on what has to be done. She just wants to cry and talk. I want to comfort her. I just wish I could bring myself to tell her how much I really, really hurt inside. But I really don't see how that, that helps her right now. Maybe later when she's stronger. Guys, if you've been through this, going through this now, your loss was hard enough, wasn't it? If you're having a tough time on the healing journey with the woman in your life, welcome to a special episode of the Bring Your Own Grief Network. You won't want to miss this. When Jack and Jill Collide, a man's primer to the grieving woman. I am, as always, your humbled host, Arglin Kelly. Up front, this episode is for those men who are mutually going through the traumatic loss of a loved one with a woman and trying to become more aware of how she processes the grief. But this doesn't mean it's only meant for a husband and wife who sadly lost a child, as I did. It might be a father-daughter, mother-son, brother-sister, depending on the dynamics of the connection to the one who was lost. So this episode can certainly aid with the interactions between a grieving man and grieving woman regardless of the relationship. And I want to thank you all. Welcome. So over the years, I've had the privilege of traveling the country, speaking and presenting workshops on the differing ways men and women process and express their grief. Mostly I speak at national and regional conferences, universities, on television, radio shows, and more. And I never stop learning, never stop discovering more. It's fascinating and, and frankly fun, although for a very sad reason. We are an incredible species, though. We take good from the bad when we can, right? So listen, for most of us anyway, we know men and women are different. And no, I don't just mean the body parts. And if for some reason you don't think it's obvious, let me offer you a quote from one of my favorite philosophers, the late great comedian George Carlin, who once said it very, very well. Women are crazy and men are stupid. And... Women are crazy because men are stupid. Now, personally, I think that sums it up pretty well, right? Now, look, I'm not knocking myself or my fellow Neanderthal brothers. We get a bad rap sometimes. I think because we just take it. But, but women certainly have their issues too, right? How many of you guys have been through what I'm about to share with you? Now, I'm on a long drive with my better half, heading out of town. We're talking, bopping and singing along to the radio, having a nice drive. Around noon or so, she turns and asks me if I'm hungry. Well, I'm not. So, of course, I say, no, no, I'm good, but thanks for asking. So, it gets, it gets really quiet in the car for a while, and I notice this about 15 minutes later. Well, I look over at her, and she has her arms crossed, just staring out of the passenger window. So, I naively ask, hey, you okay? Fine, she says. Okay, I know that tone. Hey, hey, what's wrong? Boy, you can be selfish sometimes, mister. What are you talking about? I'm hungry, but if you aren't, that's just fine. I could hear the contempt dripping from her words, so I give in. No, no, baby, I'm, I'm actually hungry too. I, I'd love to stop and get something to eat right now. Thank God she lightened up right away, and a smile crawled back across her face. Man, I, I escaped that one, didn't I? So I asked her really, really nicely, So, where would you like to eat? Oh, I don't know. I don't care. Whatever you'd like. Okay, how about we stop at Subway, grab a sub, and eat on the run? Ew, no, I had Subway last week. Okay, uh, the only fast food you really like is Chick-fil-A. You want to go there? Nah, I'm not really in the mood for chicken. Okay, where do you want to go? Oh, I don't care. Wherever you want. Mm. Still trying to make sure I stay on her good side. I say, Hey, Starbucks in. Let's find a Starbucks. You like that little foods that they have that they serve on the side, right? 
To which she replies immediately, oh no, it's too expensive. So boom, I hit the next Taco Bell. <laughs> and she didn't speak to me until we hit the hotel that night, but I got away with it. So, okay, we men might be stupid, but at least we aren't crazy, right? But seriously now, before we move on, you have to know that when we talk about women processing grief or, or how we men do it as well, we're really painting with a broad brush here. We're all individuals, as unique as snowflakes and fingerprints, and, and we all grieve in our own unique way too. So too is it that no two people within the same sex are alike. No two women may express their grief in the same way, or no two men. So then you might be asking, is it wise to discuss generalities in men and women if we're all so different in our grieving? Yeah, I, I think it wise. I think it not only wise, but a necessity, in fact. Since a large majority will respond in a somewhat similar way, generalities actually form a, a typical or, or stereotypical base, if you will. Now, I could bore you with words like, Extensive psychological studies show that the greater mass of humans respond in a manner which is typical for their physical sex, with the female on the more expected feminine scale and males on the more masculine scale. But you get it. Most guys will respond as we expect a guy would, and most women will respond as we expect a woman would. But some won't. I know several couples where the man who, for all intents, is extremely masculine, is actually the crier in the family, more external with his emotions while the female, very outwardly feminine, is more internal than he is, more prone to bottle up her emotions inside. For the majority of us, however, men tend to be more internal and women more external with expressing emotions. Agreed? So anyway, how is it that our differences can affect us when we experience a profound loss? Why should we even worry about it? For many of us, it's our differences which attracted us to each other right off the bat, right? Men and women are designed to be, by both nature and nurture, different from each other, carry different roles and perform different functions, and this goes back to the very dawn of time. Now, whether you believe that we walk from the Garden of Eden or think we crawled from the primordial ooze, I hate to break it to you, but we, as a species, humans, we have only really two resolute jobs on this planet create offspring, and then assure the survival of that offspring until it can survive on its own. It kind of gets lost in today's busy world, doesn't it? And keep that word survival in the back of your mind for now. It's important in so many things we do, consciously and subconsciously, and important where we've come from. Now, regardless, we are drawn to each other, man and woman, because we are opposites, because of our very differences. And for the most part, it's those differences that create a bond of love between us, which makes a relationship incredibly strong. Men need women. We need them to survive. Sometimes, if it weren't for women, well, if you're a believer in the Garden of Eden, think of it like this. One day, God announced to Adam that he was going to give him a mate, Eve. And why did he tell Adam he was going to do that? He said, Adam, I'm going to give you a woman. I'm going to give you a, yep, helper. God knew Adam would need a little help from time to time, you know, to, to make sure he wasn't just lying around on the weekends and, and that his clothes matched. Just too bad she was lousy with the food choices, though. Hey, guys, I'm a big fan of women, and, and not just for the obvious reasons, either. What women have done throughout our history mostly goes untold in modern days. For instance, did you know that women developed the domestication of animals we now rely on for food? They also created the ways and means to prepare, preserve, and to cook the food we eat. And women were the ones who developed agriculture, farming, amazing. All the while men were out for hunting for food. Of course, once the women perfected all of this and we didn't have to go for carry out anymore, we men just stayed home and took credit for all that, right? They gave so much and still do. There's a contemporary author out of Queens, New York named Eric Gray, who in 2003 provided an often repeated quote about women in one of his books. Now, some might think the words come off as a little sexist, but for me, it hits home. He wrote, whatever you give a woman, she will make greater. If you give her sperm, she will give you a baby. If you give her a house, she'll give you a home. If you give her groceries, she'll give you a meal. If you give her a smile, she'll give you her heart. She multiplies and enlarges what is given to her. Now, Mr. Gray finishes that wonderful passage with the last line. 
So if you give her any crap, be ready to receive a ton of now Maybe he used a little colorful language at the end, but he certainly brings wonderful sentiments, doesn't he? Give to a woman and she returns it back in greater ways. Even, well, crap. So anyway, back to the differences, male and female. Differences that attract us by nature and nurture to love each other and propagate the species. How is it that the differences in grief can be so impactful between a loving man and woman? Well, you know, I always like to remind all of us that first and foremost, after our traumatic loss, we're feeling emotions that were either never felt before or are certainly feeling them at depths we never ever imagined possible. My gosh, we're struggling with understanding ourselves, right? Early in a loss, this can be so incredibly confusing. And then we look to our partners who are not acting like we are. We forget they are different inside. We forget they do things for good reasons in ways sometimes contrary to us. And for gosh sakes, they're going through the same thing we are, feeling feelings at levels never felt before. Confused, scared, full of questions that may have no answers. And you're both tired, exhausted mentally, and no doubt, physically. For me, when I lost my son, I was so inherently locked on occupying my mind with action. We are oriented to action, guys. It's in our DNA, our nature. I wanted to get things done that had to be taken care of. Prepare my son's services in a way that truly honored my love for him. The funeral home, the church, the burial plot, the hymns, the family and friends who would attend, so much to do. But she had very little to do with that. She was wrapped in grief, wrapped in a profound sorrow and anguish of losing her child, debilitated pretty much. And it's not that she wanted to stop me doing what I was doing, but she certainly wanted me to take the time to comfort her, to let her talk about the loss with me. But for me, I had no time, I felt. Things had to be done. There was a timeline, a blueprint in my mind of things that had to be arranged, accomplished. Did you get it right? So, problem? She looked at me and wondered why I couldn't stop and grieve with her. I looked at her and wondered why she wouldn't help me. Why was she so useless? I know this was the most terrible thing that could have ever happened to us, but things had to be done. I tried to comfort her from time to time. Drive-by stuff, really. Tried to tell her that everything was going to be all right. Tried to wipe away the tears, but none of it helped her. And get this horrible thing. I actually once told her that she must not have really loved our son. If she did, she'd be doing all she could to help me send him off properly. And helping me with the family and all the things that had to be done. Can you think of anything more thoughtless? Then, a few days later, she actually responded by asking me if I truly loved our son, since all I was doing was going on and on without talking about it, without breaking down, without crying nonstop. How could I, she asked, if I loved our boy? Okay, so even more worse for me, this actually made me question myself about the love I had for my child. Was she right after all? Did I not love my child because I wasn't out of commission? No, but you can see where the problems are. We had differences in our grief expressions, our emotional outward responses. I loved my child with a love no other could have, of course, but neither his mother and I or I were understanding of the inherent ways we would express our griefs differently. That's all. You get it. So what other ways can this come out as problems in a relationship? Let me go back in time here for a sec. The beginning of man and ask you to think about century after century of human development, behaviorisms that come from survival and remain locked in our very DNA. Yeah, times are different now, have been since the Industrial Revolution, and now even more through the modern age. But take yourself back to our days on the Serengeti, generation after generation just learning and trying to survive. Now, whether by divine appointment or by random evolutionary selection, the female of our species would be tasked with carrying, birthing, and tending to our children, right? During this time, the female would be weak, vulnerable, needed protection and sustenance from her mate to survive, for her baby to survive. Man, therefore, became the hunter, the builder, the provider, and the protector. And we probably all recognize today that women are far more empathetic towards others and even more intuitive, much more so than men. 
Is this from century after century of child rearing, being able to look at an infant unable to speak for itself so young and respond to their needs without a single word spoken between them? Even more, the men would go away for long periods of time in search of food, leaving the woman behind along with the young. In order to remain safe, women would gather together in groups of other women, safety in numbers, to protect themselves against marauders and dangers. And today, psychologists agree that women are more prone to recognize the emotional state of others by simply looking at facial expressions. Is that because from within a quiet huddle for survival, they needed to scan the faces of others to, to pick out fear, danger, anything that threatened their survival and survival of their child? And with that constant need to group together with others for safety, is there really no question today that women are known to be far more social than men? They find comfort in groups and today are far more prone than men to participate with mental health professionals and even group gatherings. Do you belong to a grief support organization? The Compassionate Friends, Brief Parents of the USA, or ever been to a national or regional grief support conference? The majority of attendees are normally women. There are men, bless them, but I can tell you that whenever I meet another man showing up at a conference or workshop for the first time, he'll usually tell me he's just there to support his wife. But if he comes often enough, trust me, he gets hooked. But it's true, men don't usually participate in social groups the way women do. Women have had to gather in groups for centuries in order to survive, and survival, again, is the key, right? So. We like to hide in caves, guys. We, we don't usually do well in groups of strangers, especially other men who we aren't familiar with or close to. They're, they're a threat to our hierarchy and are mostly to be avoided, at least until we get to know them better. Women, able to seek out support, easily do well in social environments or gathering in a group of friends to use a powder room, right? They subconsciously scan faces in a crowd and react to emotions of others, too, even those they don't know. It's in their nature. Oh, and I'm not kidding about us men either. We just see almost anyone we don't know as someone to watch out for. Psychological testing has proven time and time again that when a woman is shown an expressionless or, or neutral face of a strange man, her brain doesn't routinely perceive that person as a threat. It's the opposite for a man. When shown the neutral, expressionless face of another man, the brain of male test subjects instantly goes into alert mode, assuming the other man to be aggressive. It's in our brain waves. Can't be denied. Now, it's not enough to make us jump, just enough to make us leery. Watch out for him, the, the shady little booger. And just for a little FYI for you guys, neither men nor women like holding a conversation with someone when they can't look directly at their eyes. We both subconsciously take it as an aggression when someone is speaking with us but not looking directly at us. And how does this apply to us when discussing relationship issues? How about heated conversations with your partner? Maybe as an example in the car when you're moving down the road. Lots of furtive agitation because you can't lock eyes, right? Heated conversations can escalate pretty quickly in a car. So you want to know a little trick? Stand in front of each other and have your discussions, especially the sensitive ones. Look into each other's eyes. The subliminal agitation won't be there. Only the love is there. Give it a try if the occasion comes up. I hope it doesn't, but if it does, remember this and see if it works for you. So, listen, we've talked about a, a couple of problems that could arise. One is that she's generally going to be external in her emotions, more outward and looking for comfort, support. You're going to be more internal, keeping a lot to yourself. You might think I'd caution you first to give her a break, but really, instead, I'm cautioning you to give yourself a break. Don't do as I did and think that because you aren't crying as outwardly or as often as she is, there's something wrong with you. You're fine. It's probably who you just might be. And, and if you are, I'm not ever going to tell you to try to change that. You're grieving as much as she is. You have as much pain. You're just processing it in a different way, and that's okay. Now, I know this episode is supposed to be about female grief, but real quick, would it surprise you to know that men actually experience more emotions on average every day than women do? It's true. We just hold those emotions inside more, don't we? We just hold them inside and tend to get a little moody, but that's who we are. 
Anyway, back to the relationship issues. I want to talk about the one that comes up pretty frequently from the men I speak to in the workshops across the country, helping their women, fixing things for their women. I hear it time after time. I can't fix things for her. I can't make it right. She cries and cries and I can't do anything to stop it. What am I doing wrong? Well, where does that come from? It comes from us. It, it's who we are as men. We are protectors, providers, fixers. We're action oriented. If something is wrong with our family, it's our job to protect them and to fix it, right? The problem is women generally don't want us to fix things for them. Ask yours. Ask any woman. It's a problem that comes up even for couples that haven't been going through the hell that you and I are going through now. In everyday life, women don't want to talk to you about fixing their problems. They just want to talk to you. It's, it's all they're looking for us, for, for us to listen to them, to pay attention to them, but not to fix their problems. It's been like that since the dawn of time, yet we guys still haven't caught on. And when we actually do sit down and listen to our women, if they have a problem, we try to force our solutions on them. And again, they don't want to hear our solutions. And it drives us nuts, doesn't it? We don't get it. But guys, neither does she. She thinks, why is he trying to solve my problem? I can fix my own stuff. I just want him to listen to me. Makes sense? Whether it does or not, guys, it's gospel. She needs you for comfort. She needs you to listen. She needs to know you feel as much pain as she does in the loss. She is going to need support, not solutions. Let her cry in your arms. Don't try to stop her. If she has something she wants you to fix, she'll come right out and tell you. Trust me. I go but what my dear mother taught me as a child. She said, God gave me two ears and one mouth. And that was so I would listen more than talk. My dad actually gave me a similar line later in life. He said, a man can get in far less trouble with his ears than he can with his mouth. Makes a lot of sense, but I don't seem to relate to that one very well. So listen, speaking of listening and talking, no matter what you go through as a couple or as a father, daughter, brother, sister, depending on your loss, there's always a very simple way to avoid issues. But it seems a little more difficult for us men. Talk about it. Yes, talk about it. Establish awareness and understanding with each other that the two of you are different. Different in ways that normally enhance a relationship when times are good and can be that way when times are tough too. Tougher than any of us ever wanted it to be. I was once a guest on a lengthy webinar where I spoke about the differences in men and women and towards the end the host asked if I could give some advice on how couples could get together and talk about their differences. I wasn't at a loss for words in any way, but just came back and said, well, just to get, get together and talk. It, it's not really that difficult a thing to do. Understanding and awareness is the key to any relationship. Understanding and awareness. And lastly, I want to bring up something very important to this episode. Again, I get to travel quite a bit to conferences and workshop where parents have lost a child. Invariably, in every venue, I hear the same question, the same concern. Somewhere along the way, and always almost immediately after the loss, someone whispers in the bereaved couple's ear, you know, a lot of couples that lose a child end up in divorce. And I'm here to tell you right now, this is simply not true. There will be difficulty, sure. Loss of a loved one is difficult. Grief work is difficult. It's hard on yourself, hard on her, not to mention hard on the relationship. But divorce? No. Many commission studies have been done and there is simply no evidence that the loss of a child results in divorce. Look, the average divorce rate today for first-time marriages is approximately 50%. It's high, I know, but, but a different topic. Regardless, studies do not support that the percentage goes any higher because of mutual loss. Divorce rates do not go even higher with a second or third marriage, not from loss. There are no studies I can cite, but I can tell you from the thousands of brief parents I've met and spoken to throughout the years, their love and respect for each other, which began long before the event, carried them through and actually made the relationship stronger. It's also my opinion, based on experience and from what I've observed, 
Those couples who failed after a loss had relationship issues that began long before the loss happened. Love and what makes women different from us is what brought us together. Love can keep you together with your wife, sister, or mother, regardless of the differing ways she expresses her grief than you. I hope love for one another does so much to keep your relationship strong. So that's it for this special episode of the BYOG Network. I know grief is not a lighthearted topic, guys, so I hope I haven't offended anyone with my attempts at humor today. I'm so very sorry for your loss, as I know you are of mine. But laughter truly is a good medicine. Medicine we can use right now. And hey, know that I have many other episodes here on the BYOG Network that cover the distinct differences in the way men and women express our emotions, especially as it relates to loss. Please watch them when you have the opportunity. We cover more nature and nurture and more ways we're pre-wired to respond in just the way we often do. And more than anything else, it lets us know that we're different. No two of us will grieve alike. But we are okay. Now, do me a favor, please, and leave some comments below this video and like it and share it with others who are going down the same path of healing as you and I. And hey, why not subscribe to the BYOG channel? It costs nothing. Your email is not trapped in some marketing program, and it helps other bereaved souls find us for support. Thank you. So come back again to the BYOG Network Studios, where you can bring your own emotions, bring your own pains, Bring your own questions and bring your own grief. As always, I am R. Glenn Kelly, father to my angel, Jonathan Taylor Kelly, and we both wish you peace and purpose. Mm -hmm.